I'm Donna, and um, my breed is the Neapolitan Mastiff. And I have a, still a puppy, he's about a little bit over a year old. And he's my first AKC confirmation dog. This is the second time I've been to his seminar. Um, I went for the first time a couple months ago, last fall or winter. And I learned, like, I didn't know, it's one of his examples, I didn't know what I didn't know at that point. And so I had the opportunity to come again. And I think the second time is like even better. I think the biggest change for me is that because I am so new to the AKC world, I'm not new to dogs, but it's a completely new language to learn. Um, the grooming seminar was great because after that I was like, I'll never look at a show dog the same again. Um, the handling was great because he explains everything and the reason behind it and just getting an idea of how to train your dog so that you can go in the ring with the dog. And that was just from the first time. Um, so I'm not showing an AKC yet because I know that I still have a ways to go and when I do show up I want to do a good job at it. For sure the first time I went to the seminar I was a little bit skeptical about some of the techniques and the head straight and what does that do but um, I did work through some of his program from the last time I was here till now and I started to see the difference it can make. And definitely this time around, I understand why you need to have that head straight as part of the leadership role that you're in. I understand why we do the, the pad work or the touch work on the fit pads because you need to, if you can't do that, how are you gonna show your dog? If you can't even get your dog to touch a pad on the floor, how are you gonna walk him into a ring? I mean, because a lot of people do come with real basic, you know, skill set that they need to advance. So that's part of it. Um, and then the whole stacking and everything, I'm not, like I still need to go back and work through all the basics because um, you can't work on the finesse part if you can't even like control your dog or have them follow your hand. So I want to say that. And also you can't take months off. You need to train every day. <laughs> because when I came here for my first lesson, I hadn't been training. I'd had some other priorities and it wasn't very good. <laughs> so by the second or third time, I can see progress because now it's my, my dog is remembering, oh yeah, it's clicking. Um, but even then I had a backwards, two steps forward, one step back, because then he got dominant over me again and started pulling me around. And I get frustrated. And um, the best thing I could do was put him up and start over. But I really like um, Eric's um, style of his seminars, the fact that he had, breaks it up into some lectures, but his lectures are not boring, they're, they're exciting and they're funny and he has the slides that go along with them and the videos, so it's really, really educational and he keeps you engaged and then he adds the actual activities that you do and it's, it's a lot of work to, to come to a seminar and you learn so much. So I think between, like I said, between the first one and the second one, and I would go again to a third one or do a seven day, that knowledge is just going to get more and more um, ingrained in your head. So you're more familiar with it and more comfortable. Like you're here to learn and you're here to learn what your weaknesses are and also what your strengths. So you can figure out what to do. I am Barbara Cox and I have a Phil Spaniels. And I've been doing it about 15 to 17 years. I felt like when we came, we were a pretty good team, but uh, when we got on all the fit paw stuff, I really felt like that was eye-opening. And then as we progressed each day, then it's, he didn't even hesitate anymore. So I felt like there's a, a bigger bond, a bigger trust. Linda Hess, St. Petersburg, Florida, okay. Labrador Retrievers. Okay. Lynn Perry, New Mexico. Laps. She said, you have to go. So I went, okay. I came, I've learned so much, and it's been terrific, and I'm going to go to the seminar in Georgia in September. Um, I have two four-month-old puppies at home that it'll be perfect for me to start head straight, to, just to start from the beginning, because all my other dogs at home are champions or they're not going in the ring or something, so I have this opportunity with these babies to really give them a good start and give me a better learning start. So I'm, I'm excited about that. 
I honestly, when when Eric said, "Oh, we're, I want you all to tell something about your breed, your, your breed standard, etc.," and I thought, oh, "Why do I have to listen to everybody else's standard when it doesn't mean anything to me? This is going to waste time, so to speak." I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned so much from talking about the different breeds that I was, <laughs> that was ready. My favorite I was ready. Washington. I was ready to go. I had, let's have the whole day on on everyone yes. talking about the reasons that, that the breeds have come together. I mean, I uh, that was fabulous. It really, really was great. I think that people find out. I think that you're not alone in that. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually have a um, a history in 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 learning about things like that from right from college on through and so for me it was very meaningful from the very beginning but I have seen people go from being like marginally like okay and they didn't really do a very good job the first day but the second day the third day and then the seven day seminar by the fourth day people were enthusiastically wanting to come back with Hey, right. listen to this, yeah. folks. Right. <laughs> and that really is probably one of the best exercises. That and what is our job as people? Our job as people is to create something better. And so when we. For a more st- specific need. Right, for a more specific need. Yeah. And that's where the lab came from, yeah. right there. And even well, in the lab. The- the breeding for the field lab right. and, and your companion lab, very show lab. Well, and and they're like two different, different breeds. Yeah. Just like we saw with the Swedish Valhun. Right. In actuality, yeah. if you go, on the, you go back and you look at the lab, yes, they, were, uh, they did work off the boat, but when people came from what we'll just say is the old world to the new world, mm-hmm. when you live on an island like Newfoundland, and it's a very cold climate, if you're just eating fish is your primary resource, there needs to be a secondary resource. And the lab was noted mm-hmm. by these people that came from, from Europe mm-hmm. that they were doing secondary subsistence hunting and they were retrieving. Yeah. And that's why they, they got picked up and taken back mm-hmm. and bred into uh, um, or used in a breeding program as retrievers. And that's where that came from. But it was a transitioner. Also, lots, mm-hmm. of, lots of streams and creeks. The right. is always going to be wet. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, so we're, geographically, where are the flat coats going to be working? Um, Scotland. 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 Okay. So drastic difference between Huge. there to Newfoundland. Right. <laughs> um, tidal creeks, that sort of thing. There's yeah. still a few little bitsy St. John dogs mm-hmm. way up yeah. in Newfoundland. Yeah. Supposedly. If you, if you go to England, though, you can understand why that that coat became even more important though is England before, n- not now, mm-hmm. but it was, they had a lot of thick. Thick cover. Yes, thank you. Right. And that, and, and that dog was just ideal for. And where's, and, and where's the lab gonna be in that geographical area when you're talking about Newfoundland? What, what's the primary area where the lab is gonna be? In the water. In the water, right. exactly. And that's why that coat is so much different. Right. It's, been, it's been evolved to be in that water 24-7. Right, and they literally were in, they would take like 10-month-old puppies and, and assign them to a boat, mm-hmm. and they would literally be in and out of the water all day long. They, they really worked those dogs. Yeah. So as we're starting to read our standards, we need to read the standard and be able to ask and answer the question why why is this coat like this why is this tail like that what part did the or country of origin and the original job take part in creating this dog you know what dogs are in this dog that has evolved this into what it's this its job today so i i do have one little question uh-huh. i think is that why because they are a water dog emphasis on the pad it's it's a thick pad or it's a firm thick pad i think is what the standard says you don't you, you, you don't read the word horny on there right um because they were a water dog right well you know you you've got to, not only is it just a water dog but you also have what kind of ground do you have coming in and out of the water 
well, rocky. Yeah. Okay. But the American Cocker Spaniel, what kind of ground are they going to be working on? Grass. Grass. So they have to have the horny pads to be able to have that traction ah, right there. Ah. Right. So now if you had an Ameri American Cocker doing the job of a lab, you're going to blow your pads mm -hmm. because you're going to have all that traction on those rocks. And it wasn't built for that. It was built to be working in grass. So, but if they were, if they were, say, on a boat, I'm trying to, I'm trying to visualize this. So I'm having a little bit, I'm a little stuck right here. Mm -hmm. The lab is on, if they're wet and on a boat, that's a pretty slick surface. That's a slick surface, but you still can get traction with those hard pads right there. Okay. As long as it's not smooth like the, what the American Cocker is today. Yeah. You know, you're, you're going to get traction, you're going to get durability, you're gonna, you're, you have the ultimate dog for that job out there. You've got the web feet, you've got the coat, oh, yeah. you've got everything for that dog to work in the most terrible surroundings and environment. Because people are forgetting, you're, yeah, you're in the show ring and, you're, and your job is to do a certain, reach a certain goal, but you're not looking at the whole picture if you take that attitude. Yeah. Teresa Jacobs and I have Great Danes, uh, Fawn, and I have done, I've been in rescues since 20 years or, or more, and only in um, uh, raised from a puppy to show and do performance with uh, for the last five years. I feel like I am leaving with a completely new dog. Um, she is I think more relaxed. She uh, looks to me for something other than treats or, or whatever, but I really feel like because of the, uh, still, the skills that I've learned that she looks to me truly for leadership. And I think she is much happier that way. And I really see that uh, so many of us have come from similar backgrounds. We just have a dog that looks different with a different function. So I can't really say that I was ever frustrated um, because I, I think I came in with a um, wanting to learn and wanting, uh, I came in with a clean slate and just wanting to absorb as much as I possibly could so that I could improve my, my skills, not just in, in in handling my dog, but in our day-to-day -day life at home and, and everything. Do I you just, think that you learn skills here that will apply to your everyday life? Absolutely. I've got three other dogs at home, um, and uh, I intend to start all of this with them as well, so that, uh, because obviously the, the common denominator with those dogs and any sort of dis, uh, behavior things that I have with them is me. And so if I go in and apply what I've learned over the last three days with them, I anticipate that, yeah, there may be some bumps, but we'll get through those. I, I'm not discouraged at all by anything and I'm looking forward to, to applying this across the board. <laughs> My name is Brazis Liss. I show French Bulldogs and I've been doing this a year. Okay. I'm Kim Lewis and I'm her financier. <laughs> I think being on the sidelines watching, I was able to see the changes and the growth that she's right there she couldn't see. She, you know, and I think, I think when she goes back and looks at the videos, she'll be able to see the change. But I think just being right there and being frustrated that, that she wasn't responding perfectly, it, it got her frustrated. But the changes from day one to day three are dramatic. Mm -hmm. And it, but it just, it just got her frustrated that we didn't go from day one to day, yeah. what, it's more than day 60 or, or a, year from now. or a year from now, you know, that, I mean, the dog that she's gonna be next month, next quarter, next year from the dog she is today will be totally different if we stick with it. My name's Melissa McNulty. I have a Chinese crested named Finn. 
and he's my first confirmation dog and we've been doing confirmation for not, not even a year no not even a year I knew I had a lot of work to do because I had no idea what I was doing at all and I think it brought forth a lot more growth between the two of us together giving me a lot more information because before this I was afraid to put Finn on the table and here I wasn't because I knew that Eric was going to be able to show me and teach me what I needed to do and how to show Finn the respect and give him the respect so that I could get that back out of him and it's just made leaps and bounds because every time before I was doing that I was afraid to do it and he was reading that and that's what I was getting back as he was shying away and because there was one point when we had put been on the table and I thought oh my goodness he's going to fight Eric and I'm going to be running around with the head of shame because my dog has eaten this poor man alive but then I was like oh no he can handle this it's it's okay and that's when it comes down to is having to let Finn kind of realize no we're the one that's in charge and we need to change change the attitude but now I have the skills that I need to be able to work with him and get him where he needs to but I have the confidence now that I can do that appropriately and make it fun for the both of us and have fun with it. Adding the playtime into the show area into the show training is going to be important because a flat foot, they just want to play. So I got to make the show ready. It's a fun place to be, and you know if I can make those changes, I think to getting prepared for going back into the show ring, um, then I think he'll have a whole different attitude. Not that he doesn't have the attitude, but the attitude was always focused on my eyes, yeah. you know, and what I was telling him. So obviously it needs to just be ingrained in, oh, okay, head straight is fun too, and, right. you know, going and doing a free stack is fun too, right. and then the fit pause, I'm just amazed. Yeah. I think he's going to really eat that up. So what were some things you learned from this workshop that is going to revamp your training? Actually, there's quite a few. One of the biggest ones is I need to slow down and quit rushing everything. The other is, is I need to be more fun. <laughs> like, I am not fun in the ring. I, I'm fun outside, but not in the ring. So I need to work on that. Um, one of the biggest things that I found is that when I am out away from the ring, like in a park, like when we went to the park, Rumba and I, I mean, he, I was so relaxed and I just really didn't care what he was doing. And, oh my gosh, I got stacks out of him. I had him following my hand. We were gating. Come back, put me in the ring, and I lose it all. One of the things I think I'm going to have to do, um, just because something about stepping in the ring just totally flips me out. So I think what I'm going to do is do a ton of practicing without rumba. Just go out, just set a ring up. And go enter because even when I'm just practicing or when we were doing the course um, without the dogs, we'd set up the fit pause course and then go walk it. I got way too serious. Uh, I mean, it, it was like I was concentrating so hard on not making a mistake and where my hands were going to be. I just need to go and do it like I was out at the park and forget that I'm in the ring and work with my hand signals that way. So that's one of the things I really want to work on. One of the biggest aha moments was um, going through the breed standard. And what was cool was it's not only my breed, but then hearing other people describe their breed and then going back and looking at my breed standard and reading about some, of the, some more stuff on it, plus having the illustrated breed standard really I was like, whoa, so that's why we do this, or that's why we're looking at this, or um, 
And then just hearing other people do it, it's like, okay, well now I need to go look at my breed standard because I'm really interested in like the foundation or I'm interested in, you know, how does, you know, a border collie versus an Australian Shepherd. So lots of, those were big aha. Another big aha moment for me was, um, was at the park when I was just so totally, just totally relaxed, no pressure whatsoever. And just, I mean, we were so in sync. I've never had that. And it was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Now, can I just transfer that somewhere else? Right. It's just all about being carefree. And if you're carefree and effortless, that's it exactly just, what the dog's gonna be. It, oh, and then the stack up on the log. I mean, it was just, it was just all fun. So I need to transfer and have just be like I was at the park. Here's the thing. I met Eric, Rumba was two, so about three years ago. And I did a workshop with him. And I did some private stuff with him and, and grooming and stuff. And I went back home and kind of half, half did the training, but not really seriously. And then I thought, I, and I showed, I showed the dogs, and of course, it's a disaster in the ring. And I totally forgot everything Eric said. So then I went back, and I did some more training with Eric. And it was like, yeah, I get some of this. And again, I go home and just not really doing much. But I, I liked the training, and so I go back to Eric again, and still, you know, did some more private training went to Orlando, got to learn what a big show was like. Really, in Orlando was when things really started clicking. It's like, okay, when Eric says this, and just calling him each day and dealing with issues we had in the ring. Um, we didn't go there expecting to win. I was just going there for practice. And then I was like, oh, man, I'm beginning to see this now. And then doing this workshop after having done Orlando, and I was really ready to listen. And that for me was huge. So this workshop, and just doing two days, no, it's the full on seven days, huge, huge difference. Because what I learned in two days is it just blows my mind and I can't apply, can't separate out pieces. But doing it where you've got the full seven days and then day one, you break down entering the ring with the head straight. It's like, okay. And we actually got really good at entering the ring. Now, if I could just not lose it when I enter the ring, it would be awesome. So, but yeah, it's the longer workshop makes a whole lot more sense. So I think the two biggest things for me were being consistent with my lead hand, that was something I definitely struggled with. I'm right hand dominant and I want to do everything with my right hand. And it really needs to be whatever lead, whatever hand the lead is in. So um, really being more mindful of that. And to the positivity, it has to be fun for the dog and it ha so that it's fun for me. So it's fun for the dog and it's like a circle that goes around and around. Um, those were kind of the two biggest things. Also, perfect practice makes perfect, but it's not necessarily the dog is perfect. I have to focus on me being perfect and the, let the dog kind of figure out that this is our new normal and sort of conform to that. And so um, not adjusting myself when things don't go right with the dog. Focus on doing things right the first time and then work through them from there, but always being consistent with what I'm doing and doing the right things. I think having very in intentional training sessions. Sometimes um, I definitely start out with kind of a wishy-washy plan, and I think it's really important to know what am I trying to accomplish. If it's asking a dog to put her paws on the tree, have a plan that I'm going to ask this dog to put her paws on the tree. Don't just kind of haphazardly go into it. or um, another big thing was connecting my fit paws into a course, not just doing one obstacle and then, okay, now we're doing a second obstacle and there's no flow between the two. Um, using that to kind of improve the communication that we're going through a course, um, that is something that I definitely realized I needed to do. 
And then just consistency of practice. You know, three positions three, four, and five are not going to happen on their own without practice and building that space in position two. Um, that has to be, especially with a dog like her, slowly working our way back, not rushing and yanking the treat out, or it has to be slow. And so having a plan in our training and that consistency is probably the biggest thing that I need to revamp. We've got the creativity, but we have to have the plan and the consistency. I loved learning about the breed standard because we did the seminar in November and I thought I've read my standard a lot of times, but when Eric really challenged us as to the why and really pushed us to that next level of, level of understanding, um, it was totally different and really feeling like I need to go back and study canine anatomy and biomechanics. Um, just a little bit of reading I did on croups and pelvic angles really opened my eyes not only to my own breed but what should be I should expect in another breed with a different purpose. Um, other ahas, man it was very clear yesterday the dogs mirror our bodies so again being very mindful about what I'm doing and making sure I'm right because it has a an immediate effect on my dog um, so those were the big ones Save. yeah um, I just want to thank you Maddie Patty Eric for a fantastic week um, it's been great perfect weather perfect space to train perfect class size the right amount of levity and jokes and hard work and um, it's been a life-changing week so thank you guys. What I learned from this workshop uh, is that everything about my dog's ability to win comes from me. It comes from my body language, it comes from whether or not I have eye contact or not, it comes from the preparation and preparing the dog and making sure the dog is physically fit, mentally fit, um, that it's learned to follow my hands and that my hands are giving clear directions. Um, I've always wanted a best in show winner. Now I feel like I have the tools to get there. Um, I think I have a puppy who has the background genetically and was bred to get there, but it's going to be up to me whether or not he can get there. Now, I asked her to pick easy objects. Easy objects are flat, they can have different colors, and maybe a little bit difference in texture. As you start getting higher on the objects, or more texture on the objects, then that's more of a medium to more advanced, like the bigger objects over there. You'll find that the dogs won't really fight you on the easy objects, unless they're really super headstrong and just don't respect and trust you. And then if you try to start off with all the big fun stuff that you see on YouTube, you could not get past that because this is too advanced. They're like, no, nah, I don't trust you enough to do this. Okay, so you said yellow, orange, and blue. All right, so watch as she leads the dog to the object and then tells the dog to touch. Yay! So you act the, have to ask like the invented peanut butter when they do it. See how she's leading with her hand. Yay! Okay, over to the blue. And the dog's following the hand. Now the dog kind of led. Yay! That was good. Now you noticed on the blue one, the dog was like, oh, I'm going to get to that one because I'm going to get a cookie. Yeah. So she led the dog past the object right there because you have to be the one that makes that happen. Well, this is how you prepare that dog to start paying attention to this hand. Because later I can teach the dog, when you see the next demonstration, the dog can go this way, the dog can go that way, the dog can stay, the dog can go. Wherever your palm is pointed, that's where the dog's going to go. In the beginning with a puppy, as long as the puppy's following that hand, that's all you need right there. Okay, so let's pick three medium objects now. Okay, so, um, 
the blue, the deep blue one on the end? Yeah. Okay. Can we can we do one of the little these? Yeah. The red the red dot, the diamond and the little light blue pot. No, I mean the the cones on the outside cuz oh, these are more easy right here. Those are more medium like the bigger okay. Then the diamond. Okay, she likes that diamond, huh? Well, <laughs> it's different. It feels different. Yeah, it feels different. Okay, so let's watch the same thing here. Now you notice she's not pulling on the lead. She's guiding the dog to the object. This one's, you see a little bit more. Yay! Look at that! Woohoo! He's like, yeah. He's like, all right, I'm bad. <laughs> He's got to get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> and think of the confidence this is building. Yeah! <laughs> Lindsay, Lindsay, you want to go ahead and grab a golden? Thank you. Yeah. He says, I'm ready for the advanced stuff. <laughs> so so look at how this is working this dog in the confidence and you notice that he's quicker with that now too and I'm not gonna just do one paw I'm doing both paws right here okay so let's go ahead and pick the the advanced one with the large just one large well actually let's do an orange and then let's do the do the purple and then do the peanut yeah Right. Tits! Tits! Yay! Yay. <laughs> awesome. Okay, now we do the purple one. Tits! Yay! Ooh, even the rear. Okay, let's stop for a second. So he didn't do the purple. He's like putting his little attitude in it and it's like, nah, I'm not gonna do that one. So what did she do? Took him back to the back. Took him back where the success was. And that one, if it wasn't successful, she'd go back further. And then work your way back up again. So that's the failure point right there. So we're gonna stop this exercise here. And then she, can, she knows that she's going to work on purple a little more. And you might want to get a low purple object so it's similar to that color. And you notice that, like this one here, the nubs were up. And if he continues to not do the purple, then maybe you can flip this over. Well, no, that's more on the other side. Yeah. But uh, you go back to success and keep working forward. And eventually we'll get to the point where this dog will do front feet, rear feet, all four feet. And when you get a dog that will do that on all the objects here, just think about how amazing this dog is ready to learn. Wow. You will have phenomenal dogs in the show ring. So let's give Tammy and Superstar a big hand here. Um, this is a long time ongoing process. And even once my dog starts winning, it's not done. The training's not done. It's, it's continuous and it continues throughout the lifetime of that dog, whether it's in the ring or it's at home. Um, just having a dog that you know you're communicating properly with, I think will change the relationship between me and my dogs. I, I need to remember that a frustration is just a point where I have now have the ability to get better and improve and go forward. It's not an end point. And, um, a frustration is is an okay thing. It's a totally okay thing. <laughs> and what were some of those aha moments that you had this week? The aha that if I quit looking at him, he he does better than if I'm hovering over him. That's a very difficult habit to break when you've been told repeatedly, and I was actually berated quite a few times for not looking at my dog after I looked at several of his videos, mm -hmm. and you know 
and quit looking at him and and they just let me have what have you and the biggest aha is I'm not paying attention to anybody else whatever they say it's just I'm gonna do that uh-huh okay thank you I appreciate your opinion and just let it go for, for new people this was really good because we had a variety of people who had been through classes before. Initially, I felt bad because everybody else was catching on so quickly. I'm thinking like, oh man, am I the only dummy here? And then it, you know, after you talk to everybody and figure out, well, they've been to some classes before and you build on that knowledge. It was like, yeah, I'm the only one here that's brand, brand, brand new, right. but you got to start somewhere. Exactly. So. I don't feel bad about that anymore because I'm so proud of the people that have made it through their different progressions, even though I didn't know them before. Right. You know, I can see how they've progressed. And it took some of them three days to figure out how much they had progressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes, I think that's one of the best things is having the mixture of uh, knowledgeable people or learned people and those of us who don't know anything starting off. You know, and I think the commitment of a five or seven day would tell the difference, you know, with people that really want to learn versus the weekenders. Kind of like weekend warriors, you know, in sports where you go and get hurt mm -hmm. and then say, oh, I did a 5K, limp, limp, limp. Yeah. <laughs> That's the big difference to me. I would like to see the longer classes like that. And I gave up two weeks in Sanibel Island to do this. <laughs> What are some things you learned from this workshop that's going to help revamp your training? Um, to do what Eric says. <laughs> uh, I've been working with him for about six months. When I first started, it was really um, kind of hard to not, it wasn't that I want to believe it, but everyone in the world, everyone in the ring, all my friends are telling me to do a certain way. And so it was hard to step out of that box. But this week, spending seven days and seeing the results of six months compared to some new people or who are newer to it was just eye-opening. So a lot of the things I learned were more, I think the biggest thing is how much what I do impacts her. So there was a moment where I was stacking her and I finally like thought I was doing everything right. And then you came over and said, hey, your feet are like this. And it was only an inch. And I went like that and then her foot moved. So realizing that the first thing I need to think about when I'm training is when she's not doing something, what am I, what am I doing? And then do you, do you have any big aha moments during this workshop? I think that was a big aha because it kept happening. So we'd watch video and there's this video where we would look like a circle where I was hunched over and she mirrored it with her body. Mm -hmm. And then there was, then he was telling me how to do my strides. So I was just kind of playing around. I go like this long and she literally imitated each one. And I went, oh my gosh. Um, another thing is just as far as leadership, continuing that path, the aha of like, leaving her alone, not fidgeting with her all the time, and le giving her more lead, just having that leadership, a lot of the other problems go away. Because I've spent six months freaking out because her feet position are off and her tail's never up. And to this conference was the first time stacking that her tail was up on its own and wagging and that she's positioning her feet correctly most of the time. And, it, and I realized that it has more to do with all the other things Eric's been telling me, not focus on the problem, focus on the solution. So by focusing on all these other things, leadership, my body posture, everything but her foot, now all of a sudden her tail's up and I didn't have, I didn't do it. I didn't sit there and go tail, tail for 20 minutes every day, tail. I focused on the, the solutions and now she's just stacking beautifully and it's been really fun to see. I mean, years, like when I first started showing two years ago, I couldn't even pry her tail up. She'd buck her butt under and tuck her butt and sit down. Like I couldn't even with all my might on. I set up fit paws in my house, um, in my garage and things, but I haven't set them up with the ring in mind. It's been conditioning, which is great, but I'm, I'm going to go back and say, how can I set this up like we did to prepare for entering the ring and make it fun and set up rings in my side yards and set up rings other places, take her other places and just keep practicing and do one step at a time and then keep bringing it together. I guess... I think when I first started with Eric, I coddled my dogs. I'm codependent on them. I'll clean, like They sleep in the bed with me. They're my, my family, my everything. And I was really worried when I first started working with him that I was going to lose some of that because a lot of things he's saying are never let them put their paws on you. I mean, I spent weeks just on that because everywhere we go. And I was like, even on the couch? Yes, even on the couch, never let them put your paws. And now we have 
it's weird. It's hard to describe. I feel like before I was loving on them, but I didn't really know them. And now I feel there's this respect and love between all three of my dogs, but I know them. I know what they want. And they still cuddle on the couch. We still have a close relationship, but they cuddle with their paws tucked. And they don't, and before I had a lot of, um, like my rescue would never come in the living room and I couldn't figure it out. Well, I didn't have leadership, so all the dogs would jump on the couch. And so, no, when I start making every dog gets up with permission, all of a sudden, everyone's on the couch. Everyone's relaxed. Nobody's fighting. No one's growling. And so I think for me, that was one of the biggest steps was I was worried I was going to lose a connection, but I have, and he told me, you're going to have a stronger connection than you ever have, but I didn't believe it. And now every day, like, especially after being, doing this for a week, I don't feel scared. She's going to bark or do something crazy. I feel like, okay, if she does it, cause she's still testing me, I'm going to head straighter. I have a plan and I feel closer to her than I ever have. And now I almost feel horrible because my other two, I haven't spent as much time with them this week and I went to do fit paws and we're all over the place, but I look forward to building that bond better with them, with the stuff I've learned. What are some things you learned from this workshop that's going to revamp your training? Well, this is my training. So I was a classic 80s movie coming into this. I don't know if you're old enough to know, but the movie <laughs> Less Than Zero, mm-hmm. I mean, I had visited two dog shows. I've never shown, I've never been in the ring. I've done some very basic obedience training on my own, read a few books. Um, I had a general working knowledge of head straight just from watching some of Eric's videos. But um, I mean, this is my training. So there's, there's not really anything to revamp per se because I'm following this. This is my training Bible, so to speak. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I knew I knew nothing coming into this. Um, you know, a new, a new training program is always harder than you anticipate. Um, considerably harder. There's much more to think about than I had anticipated. So it's going to be difficult. It's a long, hard road, but this is the training that I will follow and continue to follow. And then did you have any big aha moments while you were here at this workshop? Um, Yeah, the the leadership and respect, earning the leadership and respect. I'd always kind of known that, that had always kind of been my my thought process in training and working with a dog was that was something that you had to to earn. But the the ways in which to go about earning them, I've never been a a browbeat your dog into submission that was never anything I ever wanted to do I always wanted to earn it Um, but the ways that he's teaching us through hand and body communication and that your body language every little aspect means something and that the dogs can key off that huge aha moment for me Um, just to be able to understand that every moment is a training moment no matter what I'm doing walking out to potty you know, it doesn't matter where I'm at or what's going on. That's, um, it's, it's always training and that the dog is always keying off on those things. Um, yeah, that was, that was major. Perfect. And then what are you going to do before you step foot into the ring? Oh, train for months. <laughs> um, train for months, get some video equipment, do some video logs. Um, Eric has been so wonderful about, you know, just iterating and reiterating that he's willing to be a mentor and go over videos and talk about key things that he sees and being able to help. And I'm going to take full advantage of that. Um, there's no reason to go into a ring uh, set up for failure. And so many of us do that kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm looking to do this um, for a profession. It's what I want to do. It's, it's something that I'm starting late in life, so I need every advantage that I can possibly come up with. And uh, yeah, train, train, and more train, and commune with these dogs. You know, literally get into their heads and be able to, be able to speak dog is my goal before I step into the ring so that I've got every possible chance for success and not set myself up for failure. Perfect. And did you have anything else to add? Anything else you'd like to say? Um, just remember all this, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> 
remember all this, remember as much as you can, refresh and relook at my notes. I've probably got 25 pages of notes that I've taken over this week. Um, always go back to the basics, focus on the solution, not the problem. You know, everything that's been pounded into us, uh, it's all for good reason. And um, make sure to take advantage of opportunities when they're there. The thing that I get when I travel around the world and people first start coming to these workshops, or having private lessons is the biggest complaint is they say that you can't compete against the pros. Tell me about that. I, I really disagree with that actually, especially now that when I'm looking at the pros in the ring and a lot of them are making these really kind of, you know, elementary mistakes, you know, stringing the dog up, getting in the way, shoving food in your mouth, all those little things take away from the quality of the presentation. And it really stands out when you can make your dog go around on a loose leash. When you can stand back, you can give a little space. You can make them stand without shoving a loaf of bread in their mouth. There are a lot of amazing pros out there. There are a lot of handlers that Sit. can get the most out of their dogs Good. and and allow the judges to see what they need to see for them to evaluate them. And I commend them. I mean, it's, it's, it's like watching a work of art, watching some of these handlers. And, you know, we've got some great ones on the West Coast, the East Coast. Um, I've seen some in, in Europe, um, stunning in Asia, you know, all over the world. But, you know, those are the handlers that the people need yeah. to, to watch and duplicate, not the ones that are stringing the dogs up that are yanking on the dogs, that are, you know, do, shoving the piece of bait inside of their face so instead of training the dog to stand. You know, the things that you're doing now yeah. are, are able to let the judge find your dog easier, and that's why now you're beating some of the other people out there, especially in this breed right here, you know, beating some of the other people out there that aren't getting the most out of their dogs. So yeah. for those people who say you can't compete against the handler, well, my theory is if you're gonna compete against the handler, you gotta put as much work or more into competing with the handlers. Exactly. There. And that's exactly what you're doing and that's why you're being so successful now. Yeah. So yeah. kudos to you, my dear. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's almost easier because we don't have, I have one dog. I don't have 15 dogs, you know? I get one dog I get to train, condition, groom. It's, it is a lot easier, and I think if people would take a little bit of time to train for it as much as they train for agility or obedience, then it would be, you would be successful, yeah. As you've proven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's All right. right. I'm gonna let you go now. I, I take Goodness. too much of your time now. No, you're fine, thank you. <laughs> If you've had time in dogs and you're, you've got the right frame of mind, you can take home everything you need to take home.